move over to the um, Jamboard. And here at least there is one help in keeping down the lag is that you can use the link I placed in the chat uh, so you can see the, the Jamboard as it evolves directly. Okay, now to the mathematics part here. So um, as you've noticed, we've had several cases in this course where we take a quote or even a whole chapter from a mathematics book and we try to make sense of it, try to tear apart and uh, identify what it means and what it, how you could uh, code it up logically or mathematically or implement it. And one of the first things that we're saying is that we should try to find what the different symbols scope is and types are. So let's take this quote as an example. It's from another book than the one from last week, uh, MacLean from 1986. It's a classical maths book. And this here is a little snippet of code defining partial derivatives. So I talked about normal one argument function derivatives last time, and this is a little bit of an extension to when you want to compute the derivative with respect to one of the variables for a multi-argument function. And it's not that I expect you to know this beforehand, but I do expect you to know how to look at the text like this and try to assign types and explore what the meaning could be and try to find a logical definition or sort of the, the first order logic corresponding of the definitions. There will be no more demos on Tuesday is a question. Actually, there, there will still be demos on Tuesday, but we'll in parallel have the questions, uh, the work, because there was, there was there has been around 15 people uh, on the Tuesday demos. And that uh, means that there are 45 others who could very well be asking questions about uh, exercises or labs or something like in parallel. Sorry, that was a, a, a split from the partial derivatives because I just saw that it was a question in the chat, which I had missed um, a minute ago. Okay, <clears throat> so let's see, what are the symbols and their types? So the first thing mentioned uh, is a function, and then it says z equals f of x and y. So it's not obvious uh, a priori what a function, what the function is, but I would say that the f from our knowledge of how names are usually used in mathematics, I would say that f is the function. So from that, that definition by itself, we can conclude that uh, now I should write with read pen. F has type, well, it looks like it has a pair type, and pair types are usually in mathematics it's written using a Cartesian product. So I assuming we're talking about real numbers here. I haven't shown you the context of the code, but it was a part of real analysis. So two real numbers, and it returns a third real number. So if you want to annotate these slightly, uh, we can guess that this is x, this is y, and this is z. I mean, the x has type r, y has type r, and z has type r. OK, what is next? <clears throat> well, it says this actually holds not for all points x and y, but only for points x and y in some open set u of the Cartesian xy plane. So here is another use of x and y. So you might wonder, is this the 2, 3 plane or the pi e plane? Well, clearly not. So the use here x and y uh, and x and y plane as a name for the usual two dimensional plane uh, of geometry. And the x and y here are no, not variables. So it's a bit tricky that the, the use of x up here, then they are really variables, arguments for f, but here it's just names. Anyway, this, this indicates that the function f is actually not defined necessarily for all pa pairs of x and y. So an alternative type for f, the more fine-grained type would be its u to r. So u is then just a name for that subset of the pairs of our of, of two real numbers, which are uh, for which the function is defined. I mean, the function may, for example, be one over x plus y. In which case, there are certain points where x plus y is zero, and the function is not defined. Okay, 
So that's f, x, and y, and z. Then it talks about holding y fixed and saying the quantity z remains just a function of x. So the quantity z can, in some sense, if you fix x, uh, no, it can be if y is fixed, seen as a function of x. So there is some other z here, which is actually a one argument function. So it does, it's not really given a name. I mean, z is really the function or the expression with two arguments in here. But uh, they're trying to give a hint about the definition. So, and then further down, we can see more explicitly, even though I would say not explicitly enough. Anyway, this function, uh, which is not named, where, where the z has just a function of x, when it, that function has a derivative, then it's called the partial derivative of the f function. Okay, so this is a little bit tricky because they got lots of different variables around, and so they at least go down to writing an expression. So they say, this first part is basically defining the notation. So it's a partial derivative, and this little delta thing is sometimes pronounced del and sometimes partial. So del z over del x, that's this expression, that's defined to be well, it's not defined to be, it's given another name, which is f prime x of x and y. And then it's defined to be this limit expression. So we know from last week or this uh, Tuesday actually that the limit will return a real number. So that means that we, we can type the whole expression here. Let's make it blue. Uh, this expression here, as type R, or so, sorry, it should be a slightly longer uh, bracket. The, the, the whole thing, the whole right-hand side has type R. And um, if I use another color here, this expression, whoops, is used as, where x and y are kept constant and only age is varying. So this, it's like a, it's a one arg expression in age. So age is the free variable that's supposed to be moving. X and y and f are supposed to be constant. And then you take the limit as age goes towards zero. And as before, we are not allowed to put h equal to zero because we actually divide by zero in that case. Okay, but if the right-hand side here has type R, that clearly indicates that both of these expressions should also have type R. So let's just record that. So del z del x has type R. And uh, it also means that, oh, let's, let's make a little par here. So this is ended. Uh, it also means that uh, f prime x has the same type as f. So why do I say so? Well, we can see that f prime x is also applied to a pair, which are these, these two variables, and it returns a value which we already said has type R. OK, so that means that uh, whatever f prime x is, it has the same type as f had. And this is a, a general pattern here. How can f prime x and dz dx have different types when they are defined the same way? f prime x and dz dx. Well, yeah, so that's a very good question. So I'm notice I'm saying that this function has this type. And I'm saying that because when we apply that function to a pair, then we get the r, which is this. So there is a, there is a correspondence between this r and this r. 
So f prime of x is a function, but f prime of x applied to x and y is just a real number. But I mean, it's um, so it, they are not defined the same way. It's the same way. I mean, this this is defined to be well equal to a certain real number, and I'm saying that f prime is defined by first applying it to two arguments and then become a real number. So f prime itself without its two arguments is the function. But it's a very good question. I mean, we have to keep these things apart. And it's a bit unclear on the, on the left-hand side. Uh, I mean, z at which point x and y, that's, that's not uh, visible from the notation. And that's actually when, when they write this, they are referring to this expression up here. So um, this should be, this expression should be the same as del f of x comma y del x. I'm not sure if this is visible, it's a bit crowded there. But uh, the way they define, or they, there's a hint at the definition of z up on the first line, is that whenever they write z, they actually mean f applied to x and y. So something like uh, this. And then they only introduce a new syntax here with f prime. Then you might notice it's a bit confusing because they use x um, in this second expression in two completely different ways. So they have this little x subscript here. And that is not to be seen as that when, if I apply f prime to two, this should be f prime two. And if I apply x f prime to pi, this index to be pi, this is really the name of the variable, variable with respect to which we're taking the derivative. So this x is a name, and this is the, the, the variable which actually is, is allowed to be changing. So it's, the notation is definitely, well, a little bit confusing. Okay, is there anything left which we haven't typed here? Well, I, I'm, there is the age. So let's, let's say that age is also probably a real number, but it's not any real number. So it's, it's not allowed to be zero. So I say here set minus and then the, the singleton set zero. So that's what age is allowed to be in the limit expression. Okay, good questions. Um, I'm trying to see if I'm actually recording. And if I'm not, I need to do so. No, I am recording. Good. Yes, let's move to the next slide, so to speak. Um, now, as I mentioned, I'm not all that fond of the notation circled or framed in blue here, the f prime x notation. Uh, maybe the notation I'm using instead is not also not obvious, uh, optimal, but I will use d1 of f. So why that? Well, I want to be able to type d1 in itself. So d1 here is supposed to be the type of the operation of taking the partial derivative of a two argument function. So d1 of f is a two argument function, d1 in itself, takes a two argument function as an input. So let's see if we can provide its type. So I, I've first given here uh, a type signature, well, an empty type signature, and then the pattern for defining it. So the pattern here is the hint at the typing, but you have to be careful with the reading of it. So D1 is the operator, the differential operator. F is the first argument, and the pair X and Y is the second argument. But notice that f does not get to see this x and y immediately. So d1 gets an f separately, a whole function, and a pair. So this is not the same. Maybe I should type that out. This is, um, this is not the same, or yeah, <laughs> it's not the same as d1 of f of x and y. So that would be a D1 applied to one real number, but it would not be able to do its, its job if it only applied to one number. To compute the derivative, it really needs 
access to the function. On the other hand, it doesn't need the, the second argument. It doesn't need the x and y at that point. It can be applied, supplied with that later. So let's, let's try to move this, this comment um, up here just to keep it out of the way because I will have some other writing to do. And then I need to complement it. So d1 f x comma y is not the same here. So basically the parentheses, the parentheses in reading this is d1 is applied to f and then to the pair x, y. Okay, so let's now see if we can define the type of d1. So d1 should take a function from, oops, a little bit early there, from r cross r to r. That's the first argument. That's the f, which has this function type. And then it should take a pair of real numbers and it should return a real number. So we can also add a parenthesis here if you want to, just to see the symmetry of the type. So as all the other derivatives we'll be looking at the course, it takes a type and then returns something of a type and returns something of the same type. Okay, and we will use the, okay, can't we just apply D1 to F then D1 has type R cross R to R cross R. Well, so F does not have type R cross R. So this, this was a question, uh, can we, this, what, what if we apply D1 just to F? Well, F, as I mentioned, uh, the F here is a function that takes a pair as an input and D1 is applied to that function. A function is not the same as a pair. This is the pair. This is the second argument to D1. I'm not sure. Oh, I've got a black box perhaps here in the way. Okay. Okay, great. So let's see the definition here. Uh, I will do it using the limit. Uh, so we have the limit function from last uh, lecture. So we call it, oh, now I should have a pen. So it's the limit at zero of a function of age. And I will give a name to that function. I will call it Psi one. It's very similar to the function we had before. Psi one will need to take F as an argument and it will need to take the pair X and Y as arguments. Notice again, Psi one takes F, X, uh, F and the pair X, Y as separate arguments. So basically it has three inputs, the F, the X and the Y. It does not take the result of applying f to x and y, because if it would, then it wouldn't be able to compute the derivative as we'll see. Anyway, so this is the definition of d1. Of course, it needs give, it requires me then to define what psi one is. And I've started the left-hand side of the definition of psi one down here. So this is very similar to what we did last lecture. Now it's just for a function of two arguments. And the definition up here from the, from the math book is giving me exactly um, the definition I should be using or very, very nearly the definition I should be using. So given all these arguments, it should be F applied to the pair X plus H and Y, whoops, this should be a plus X plus H and Y and then minus f of x and y, and parentheses divided by h. So I just copied down this definition, but it's worth thinking about what it's doing. So notice it does not apply f directly. Whoops, I wasn't intending to draw there. I should just circle it. So the f here is applied not to just x and y, but to an, a changed x and y. So I change X a little bit by adding age, and then I let F get hold of it. And here, on the other hand, I do apply F to the X and Y. It's also worth noting that 
when I apply psi to f and x, y, then x and y are constant. So the thing that the limit construction is doing there, this part of the expression is just a constant. It doesn't vary. It's only this part that varies. So that could be worth keeping in mind. And then the reason I type this in is because the definition up here does not tell you how to take the partial derivative with respect to y. But that's what psi 2 would do. So with the exact the same definition up here, there, but using it, the 2 as an index of psi, then we could see that maybe that helps in understanding the difference here. So in that case, x is kept constant and y is changed by h. So the only difference here is that the plus h has ended up in another position. And as before, when, when we send an argument into lim at zero, the argument has to be a function. So this function takes age to this expression. X and y at this point are fixed, but only age is varied. And then we take the limit as h goes to zero. So actually at the, the end, we will only get one real number out. But the argument, the limit operation is a function of, of one argument, which is h. OK, let's see if we can fill in then the type of psi 1. So we know that the first argument is a two argument function. So r cross r to r. The second argument is a pair, an r cross r. That is the, the pair x, y. And then it takes age. And remember, that was actually r minus the element 0. And then we return just a real number. So psi 1 is a higher order function taking a two argument function in a pair, the position we want to compute the derivative in, an age, which is this little perturbation we're using to find out how quickly it's varying. And it returns, well, basically a measure of how quickly it's varying. I mean, for each age, we will get an approximation of the derivative where we have a certain uh, finite difference quotient. And then when we let age approach zero, we will get the actual derivative, the actual partial derivative. But you may notice here that the definition lim at zero of a function, that's exactly the same style as before. So it's really is adding how to do derivatives in two arguments based on how to do it on one argument. OK, to sum up some of these things, let's look at the next slide. Um, so here. I first summarized that D1, okay, isn't the type for D1 wrong at the moment? Uh, let's go back. I assume it was on the previous slide. Um, uh, since we take in an R cross R. Um, so when, when I, so the first argument to D1 is, is the function F. So that's correct. And then, you can see from D1 here, it returns a function that takes a pair. And there is no special type. I mean, we, if we want to, we can add an extra parenthesis here in the definition. So the result of D1 applied to F is in turn a function which takes X and Y as the first argument. So the X and Y, yes, we take that as an argument to D1, but it, and it, this type up here actually says that. It's just that I put an extra parenthesis, which is not necessary, to read the type as taking one argument and returning one function. But returning a function is, at least in Haskell and uh, um, lambda calculus and so on, equivalent. Is this valid Haskell? If it would make a lambda, it would make sense. Well, it is valid Haskell. So. Uh, at, at any point, let's let's make an example here. If you have an example of Q of F equals lambda P 
to E. Then you could also just as well say Q of F and, oops, sorry, Q of F and P equals E. These two definitions are interchangeable in Haskell. So you can choose if you want to put the lambda expression with a matching on the P on the right hand side or on the left hand side of the equality sign. Yeah, it's interesting. It's, it's um, rather cool, actually. Good questions. Let's move to the next slide. So here I'm trying to summarize a few of the things. Uh, so the, the talking about the types of D1 and D2 is important. So I haven't defined D2, but it's a very similar definition to D1 used in the Psi2. So I was saying it takes a, a two-argument function, it returns a two-argument function. And here is just a little bit about the notation. So I say here that D1 is equal to del del x. So this is a, a commonly used mathematical not notation that you, instead of just writing del f del x, uh, when you want to talk about it separately, this, this operation of taking the derivative, you write it sort of with a, with a hole after the upper del. So it's del del x. And when you do that, that indicates that the name x has been used in the definition of some function f to which you want to apply the derivative. So this is a bit tricky. I mean, it's a matching by name here. It assumes that in the context somewhere, there is a definition of an operation which uses the name X for some of its parameters. And it's, I mean, there, there are these two ways also in programming languages. Sometimes you can match by name and sometimes you can match by position. So the one in D1 here is saying that this will do the derivative, the partial derivative with respect to the first argument of its function. Regardless of that, if that's called X or A or Z or B or whatever you want. So, uh, but when it actually has a name here, then it requires basically that the definition use that name. And at least in theory, it should also mean that if I've switched Y and X here, then this derivative should be on this, not equal to D1, but equal to D2. So it really depends on where the name is used in the definition of the function. So this is matching by name. And I, I wrote the D2 as well here. So this is derivative, the partial derivative with respect to the variable Y, which then assumes that it's the definition with a Y used somewhere. Um, and then as somebody was mentioning, there was a, a, some confusion about the type of del z del x and this f prime. So notice the f prime, we've explicitly applied it to the pair so that we get a real number out. Uh, while here, it's not really clear what it's applied to. But as I mentioned, we have this in scope, the fact that z is supposed to be the f applied to x and y. And this is a common usage in math books that they give an expression like this, and then they interchangeably call it an expression or a function. So you would very often see in a math book, they would say the function z. But z here is not really a function. I mean, z is the value you get from f if you apply it to x and y. But then they really mean symbolically, mathematically saying, okay, Z is an expression with two, three variables, X and Y. And having an expression with two, three variables is basically the same as having a two argument function. But it is tricky when you start doing things like the definition of derivatives and so on, because you have to be very careful when, when you bind these names. Okay, so this question here, surely Z is only a value of X and Y are defined. Yeah, <laughs> well, but, but does it mean that X and Y are defined? But I, I think it's, it's very often helpful in, in different contexts and mathematics definitions to try to keep track of what is an expression and what is a function. Here I just pointed at, at Z. If X and Y are only symbols, basically just a lambda, yeah. But anyway, if, if we would have applied this del del x, this partial derivative would apply with respect to x to f, then we would get a function out. And this is important to note, that having applied this derivative, we still don't know at what point. In the text, they say, thus at a point x, y, 
we compute this. So they have applied this partial derivative to the point x, y. Why did we switch from u to r cross r? Well, yes, um, I mainly because I'm going to move to another example after the break in which there is not this particular u, but and also partly because I want to make it explicit, u is a little bit too anonymous. The u is, is just some set, and I don't know if that is a set of pairs or not. So just to make it a little more visible, uh, I've, I've written here r cross r, but it could just as well see, say, u and u in this example. Uh, but I just want it to be applicable or visible that it's actually pairs they're talking about. Um, so as we have a few minutes before the break, here is an empty page where I can try to compute some partial derivative and we see if we can figure out this, these examples. So let's say that we, we use the, the, the right writing they had there. So z is f of x and whoops, uh, x and y say it's uh, x squared plus y x. Switch slide, please. Good point. I switched on my uh, Jamboard, but not on screen. Thank you. So, OK, this is now supposedly a definition of a function f. Uh, it's defined for all x and y. And I should be able to compute these derivatives. So what is the partial derivative of z with respect to x? which then you could wonder at what point, what do we say uh, here implicitly at x, y. Or, well, actually, just to be extra clear here, let's say that we want to do this at a, b instead. So, um, and this comment is not after the equality sign. It's sort of supposed to be an extra explanation of where I want to compute this. So first, we, I, I don't want to use the, the formal definition here. I just want to, because I won't fit it into the five minutes left, but we should, the intuition for computing partial derivatives is really to, to look at the expression we've got and try to see how does it vary when I change x. So any suggestions on if we just look at y as a constant, remember from the definition, if we keep y constant, what is the derivative? OK, so there is a suggestion here, 2a plus b. So 2a plus b. Well, so y, a, and b, well, I said that, that this was a corresponded to x, b corresponded to y, and the x squared will be 2x, so that's 2a. And the yx, the derivative of that, uh, is just y, which is b. Uh, OK, somebody said, yes, dz, dx, dx equals 2x plus y. Uh, maybe it was intended to be dz, dx. Uh, OK. So this is an example of computing derivative with respect to x. And then we can, of course, also compute the, the partial derivative with respect to y. Let's say at x0, y0. Whoops, that should be a pair and not a. So the reason I'm, I'm taking different points here is just to keep track of, of the derivative operation and the renaming operation to, to sort of combine them. OK, if I want to compute a derivative with respect to y, any suggestions? Yeah. Um, yeah. There are several suggestions here. So the thing is that when computing the derivative with respect to y, I'm keeping x constant. So this is just a constant, which means its derivative is 0. And this is a constant times y, which means the derivative is just that constant. So the derivative is x, and x is at here, x is 0. So one of the, well, actually, two of the suggestions from the chat was, was the, the right answer here. And b would have worked if I had said at point a, b. So, Remember again, when I sort of practically want to compute this partial derivative, it's actually not as difficult as you might think. I just have to sort of be blind to all the other variables. So everything else, except for the name, 
that is mentioned down here is kept constant. And then I said, it's a bit tricky. Uh, and why do I say that? Because sometimes the in interesting things in, um, in mathematics is done with side conditions. So maybe they say that, um, you know, um, and we'll see examples of after the break. They say that this is x squared plus yx, but they also say that, oh, by the way, x is equals to uh, 2t and y is equals to 1 minus t. So this is supposed to be two times t. So something is moving in a two-dimensional space according to a time variable t. And if that's the case, then uh, the der derivatives, you have to be really careful with uh, derivative with respect to what? I mean, here, in the definition of partial derivative, this really is with respect to x. And that is not affected by the fact that x and y vary together. So in the definition of partial derivative, this really does not care about x being defined as something else. But of course, if we would compute, whoops, now this was unreadable. Um, if we would compute the, well, actually that's a total derivative, but let's, let's write it this way anyway. So the, the derivative of z with respect to t, then we would first have to substitute the x definition and the y definition in, and then compute the derivative. Uh, and there's not much enough time right now before the break to compute this one, but it's, it's worth noting that it's very often, both in math books, physics, and other cases, that you, you have this sort of two-stage thing. You define something to be a function, and then on the other hand, these variables are actually also in turn defined to depend on some third thing. But this was uh, perfectly filling up the first uh, uh, lecture part. So let's uh, take a break, what passed, and um, continue then. And you can uh, chat, ask questions in the, in the break.